Despite the intro that you saw there, this is a regular recycled review, but there is a wee bit of a different take on it. Uh, I had a summer holiday in Spain this year and it's a family home. We go there and over the years I've managed to collect quite a few whiskey bottles and I noticed this trip, so many of them were down very, very low. So what I decided to do was attempt to bring you some recycled reviews from Spain. However, when I found an idyllic, quiet little glass recycling bin in Spain in a quiet street, there were no pedestrians, there were no spectators, there were no joggers, and there was very little passing traffic. Right up until I pressed that record button. Do your best to enjoy this. <sighs> Family's had a wee black bend here in Spain now for a number of years and always used to uh, look forward to stopping in duty free on the way over here. It's now known as Global Travel Retailer GTR. And most of the bottles I've got in the bag here are just an accumulation of those trips and they've been sitting here for years. It's quite a cool room and quite a cool cabinet in a dark corner. And these whiskies, to my palate, have not really deteriorated much over years of having them here. But this trip, I've decided to drain these bottles and share my thoughts with you. Not only on these individual whiskies, but just on that whole idea of global travel retail, because I don't think it's anything like what it used to be. Let's get started. I'll go back to the one I've had here for the longest time. This is a bottle of Balblair 99. Now this was a, a 1999 vintage of course, so all the distillate in here is from 1999. This was bottled in 2017, so that makes it an 18 year old product. This was 65 pounds, but I'm going back to 2014, 2015. Probably need to check my Instagram account to see when I bought this. But I would have taken a picture of it at the time and shared it with you all. This was a pretty decent whiskey, as all these Balblairs were back in the time. Some batches were good, some batches not so good, but generally they were pretty good. And a natural presentation, natural colour, and chill filled, 46% ABV, and always a vintage on there, and a decent price. There was nothing to complain about. Those days are long gone now, not just in travel retail, but Balblair in general, they've gone through a rebranding, obviously. This was a nice whiskey to pour. I would give this a strong 8 out of 10 and suggest that this was one of the treasures that once upon a time you could pick up in travel retail. 8 out of 10. Then time moved on a wee bit and Diageo brought out their new range of Mortlach. Now this was a kind of rebranding of the rebranding. It was just kind of almost like a failure after a failure. This one I was quite excited about. This one came out at an oddball 43.4% ABV. This is their 16 year old. I think this was about 65 pounds. Don't quote me on that at the time. I was really looking forward to this because Mortlach is such a distinctive spirit and I wanted this to be a good representation of that. Anyway, this one for me, it would inevitably ended up being a bit of a letdown. Maybe something to do with that oddball 43.4% ABV. This is 16 year old Mortlach, big weighty spirit. What's it doing at 43.4%? It should be presented a wee bit higher than that to give us that full on Mortlach experience. But this particular beast of Dufton let me down a little bit. There's a wee bit left in this. It's decent. But for 16 year old malt spirit from Mortlach, should be a lot better. Seven and a half out of 10. I didn't replace this and I won't. Okay, move on a wee bit to a couple of years ago, three years ago, four years ago, not very sure now. This is a Laphroaig. No age statement on this one. 
but 48% ABV. So I was quite keen to try this Laphroaig PX cask. This was, I believe, a Global Travel Retail exclusive, and there was a few people talking about it at the time. Uh, a subtle third maturation in cask that once held Pedro Jimenez sherry. A nice thing if you're coming over to Spain, right? So this one appealed to me. However, my overall experience with it was a wee bit watered down, if I'm honest. For me, this was Laphroaig at 48% ABV, the peat, the ash, the smoke, the medicinal notes, all of that was there. Unfortunately, what wasn't there was mouthfeel. This was a thin Laphroaig. It was almost like regular Laphroaig, amped up a little bit with a little bit of kind of sweet spice and jamminess added to it. I kind of enjoyed my time with it, but it took me a long time to get through this litre bottle. I would have to say, I wouldn't be interested in having this on the shelf again. It was kind of half-baked thing. Wasn't sure what it wanted to be. Didn't love it. Seven and a half out of ten. And my last global travel retail duty-free pick was this one, a Deanston that I picked up. Probably most recently, maybe 2019, I think, about three years ago, pre-pandemic times. This one is interesting. There was a 2008 release, a cast strength release of Deanston at Bordeaux, and that was fully matured in Bordeaux red wine casks. Now, I think what's happened here is that they've um, emptied those Bordeaux casks. Now, I don't know this, I'm just guessing, but they've emptied those Bordeaux casks and tipped some Deanston into the casks and given it a finish and made it 10 years old and released this into Global Travel Retail as an exclusive. It did okay, but if you loved that 2008 cast strength Bordeaux matured Deanston and then tasted this, this is a pale imitation, it's a completely different thing. But Deanston is one of those kind of shapeshifter spirits that seems to do quite well in any cask you put it into. So this was fairly decent, I would say not bad, not too bad. Didn't love it, didn't hate it. Enjoyed my time with it. I would give this probably 8 out of 10 to be fair to it and say that out of the slim pickings from global travel retail that you have these days, this wasn't bad. Not bad. I think the problem with global travel retail today is that the producers are trying really hard to get their products in that great shopping window, you know, all the whiskey curious folk that are traveling through there, it's a good place to have their products. People at Travel Retail know this and they want them to have the absolute best product they can provide, but more importantly, at the cheapest price to maximize the profit. I'm just guessing here, I don't know what's going on. What I can tell you is that year by year by year, Global Travel Retail seems to be getting worse. I think that we're seeing people move into watered down versions, finishes, oddball releases, usually non-age statement that I think are meant for price point to maximize profit and I don't think it's the producer's fault I think it's the dynamics at play in global travel retail I think that's why we're not seeing our liters of Lagavulin Stiller's edition anymore we're not seeing our, our wonderful long worn 16s and things like that those days are gone and unless something changes unless the scotch whiskey industry and the whiskey industry in general stands up to global travel retail we're going to continue to see watered down products through travel retail that's my belief and opinion so what's the alternative what else can you do well you can wait till you get to your destination and i'll share with you what i've picked up locally over the years so i'm in spain and spain makes its own whiskey here are a couple of bottles that I picked up of local Spanish whiskey, both from DYC, I think it stands for Distillerias y Crianza or something like that. Um, but this is a single malt from them and a blend from them. Now, the blend is very typical of a blend that you would buy in Spain. This is intended for mixing, this is intended for going in long drinks and things like that, but it can be sipped on its own over a wee chunk of ice or something. But it is kind of grain heavy and typical of a blended product. However, one thing I will say, this goes toe to toe with the cheaper end of Scotch blends. In fact, I would say that this is a bit better and I paid 10 euro for this bottle and I enjoyed my time with it. For that alone, it deserves a seven and a half out of 10. 
and here we have their single malt. This is a 10 year single malt. Now, okay, it's at 40% ABV. Maybe the Spanish don't have the confidence yet to present the product at 46 until filtered natural color. But this was fantastic drinking whiskey neat in a mixer, however way you want to cut it. For 40% whiskey, it was very enjoyable and it was 14 euros, eight and a half out of 10. And every time I see this on the shelf, I'm picking a bottle up. It makes perfect sense out here. Well done, DYC. I think locally they're known as Deek. But you don't need to stick to Spanish whiskies if you're buying locally. Scotch is a global export, so what can you buy in the Scotch realm out here? Well, here's a very popular blend in Spain. This is Ballantyne's famous Scotch blended whisky. This was actually barely up to scratch with the DYC blended equivalent. And this was a lot more expensive. This was almost twice the price of the local DYC. I would prefer the local stuff from here on in, given the difference in price. And I would say if Scotch whisky wants to keep its reputation as being one of the best, it needs to do a wee bit more than just rely on name and brand, I think. Still, Valentine's Finest was okay on a warm day. Six and a half out of 10. You can get it in a plastic bottle as well. I suppose for putting in suitcases. I also managed to pick up a Loch Lomond. This is a 46% Loch Lomond. This is a single grain Scotch whiskey. But remember, single grain on the label doesn't mean that it's actually grain whiskey. This is 100% malt. It's just made through a coffee still. So under SWA regs, it has to be called single grain. This made a lot of sense out here. They've got a peated version of this as well, which is a wee nudge more interesting than this one. I would probably go with the green label peated one over this, but this was still fantastic whiskey. 22 euros and I would replace it and keep it in the cabinet over here. Decent stuff and seven and a half out of 10. And finally, finally, I don't think we can talk about malt in Spain without talking about this bottle of whiskey. This is Cardu. This is probably one of the biggest, if not the biggest selling malt whiskey or single malt whiskey in Spain. Famously, there was a case about 20 years ago where there was so much demand in continental Europe and particularly Spain that Cardu actually didn't have enough whiskey to satisfy demand. So famously, they just changed the label from single malt to pure malt and they started to mix in other malts from Glen Ord and other places. Obviously, that caused a bit of drama at the time and rightly so because the branding looked absolutely the same. And this was one of the things that caused the regulations to be rewritten in 2009. You can't do that anymore. Anyway, this was a decent bottle. I actually bought this this trip and managed to get through the bottle over the course of three weeks. And very enjoyable it was too for a 40% whiskey. I would give it seven and a half out of 10 and say that when you're buying this for 20 euros here in Spain, it's a no brainer. A decent wee malt for that price. Anyway, board the Global Travel Retail. I'm just gonna keep buying locally from now on. Now, back to... So there you have it, that's pretty much the best I could do. I didn't have any camera gear there, I didn't have a mic, um, I didn't even have a phone because I dropped mine in the sea. I was using my son's phone, uh, so hopefully I've managed to somehow edit that into something that's barely watchable. Anyway, we've still got some regular recycled bottles to get through as well. There's only nine this time, but adding on to the nine that you've just had in Spain, that's more than you would usually have. I've been working hard. Anyway, let's get started on these. Let's start with a couple of duplicates. This is one I've had a couple of times before. I'm on my third bottle of this. This is Loch Lomond. This is the standard Loch Lomond 12 year old and Loch Lomond, believe me, is getting better and better all the time. Certainly to me and my palate. Uh, this is a standard one, which is kind of ever so slightly tiny bit peated. They've got a fruitier version from the straight neck pot stills, a 12 year old called Loch Lomond Inch Murren. 
And they've also got a peated version Loch Lomond 12 inch Moen. This is one that sits in the middle, although the branding is a wee bit different. It's been updated once more since this one, so your bottle may look a wee bit different regardless. It's still going to cost you about 35, certainly sub 40 pounds, and it's going to be very good whisky. It's going to be non-chill filtered, it's going to have a 12 year age statement on it, be served up at 46% ABV. The only fly in the ointment is there still as in a wee bit of caramel colour. Even though they've moved to clear glass now, they've managed to dial down that caramel colour a little bit, but they're still using a little. Wouldn't it be amazing if the inch more and the inch more and the standard 12 all moved to fully natural? It would be fantastic regardless. Loch Lomond are making great moves, bringing better and better whiskey all the time. And for that, I'm going to say yes, I'm going out to get myself another Loch Lomond 12. And this is an 8 out of 10 whiskey. I hope you're enjoying yours too. Here's another duplicate. I've reviewed this before. This is called Karen. This is Kokerin's 16 year old. The one I've reviewed in a recycled review before was the uh, 2020 release, the first release. This is the 2021 and for a lot of people this one was not quite as good as the 2020. They felt that the 2020 one was a bit better. I'm not so sure, I just think it was a wee bit different. The 2021 was a, sl a slightly more, almost richer, saltier, peatier to me and the 2020 was a little bit more mineralic. However, batch three is out now. I have one in there and I'm working away at it. If you're interested, there's a review on dramface.com going out this week. You might be interested to pick that up. But I'll say that for 65 pounds, 60 year old, all natural Campbelltown single malt whiskey, there's just no argument to be had. I know that depending on where you are, if you're in continental Europe, certainly if you're in North America, you're paying a bit more for this type of whiskey. That's down to supply chain. The distillery, unfortunately, I'm not seeing that. It is a shame because they are putting out faithful, honest, reliable, good whiskey at great value prices. I love this stuff. I really do love it. If I can get it, if I can get it fairly, and I'm not taking it away from anyone else, I'm going to continue to pick this up. Nine out of ten. Well done. Go get it. Smashing. Let's stay in Campbelltown. This is Campbelltown Loch. Now, Campbelltown Loch used to be a blended whisky. It used to be a blend, but now it's blended malt. There's no grain in this anymore. It's all malt whisky and it's all the better for it. What a move by Mitchells to bring out something that's much more accessible when Ca Campbelltown whisky, especially from Springbank, etc., is in such high demand. They brought this blended malt whisky out. Now, we don't know what's in it. We don't know if it's Glen Scotia. We don't know if it's all Mitchell stock. We don't know if it's a mix of both, but it doesn't matter because it's just good whisky. And at £35, which is what I paid for this, it's really good whisky. I managed to pick up a second bottle of this and I'm quite happy to just pour it and relax with it and share it and it's just easy drinking whiskey. Terrific stuff, I would give it a solid 8 out of 10. And the new batch has just come out this year in the last couple of weeks, I'm just getting my head around it now, I've just started to enjoy it. Um, I think it's an easy one to recommend because of the value proposition, and if you're interested in Campbelltown whiskies, this is definitely one to pick up. Despite it, despite it having some young whiskey in there, clearly some young spirit in there, I still want to give it an 8 out of 10. It's right up my street. Everything's 8 out of 10 these days, isn't it? Everything's 8 out of 10. There are flaws to scoring, no doubt, but if you're interested in how I score things here, have a wee look at the spreadsheet that's linked below. It's not only got my original scores, but it's also got a column for if I can change my mind and anybody that knows about whiskey. And certainly reviewing whiskey will understand why that might be quite fun. But remember, it's only ever my opinion, and it's not all about the score. Anyway, here we have something that I've reviewed before in the past. I've reviewed two Lagavulin Distillers editions. This is the standard 16-year-old, uh, but it's been given a little bit of extra maturation in PX Pedro Jimenez casks. This is very typical for Diageo. They take their classic malts and they give them an extra evolution of maturation and they call it their Distillers editions. They're not always available all the time, but they're fairly large outturns and they're fairly widespread and mostly available most of the time. This particular one is 1998 distilled and bottled in 2014. So despite it being non-age statement, it does have a vintage on there. So they're basically taking their 16 year old and adding a wee bit of dimension to it using PX casks. It's down to you whether you prefer that more than the original 16. For me, it's dependent on mood. One night it's this one and another one, it'd be the standard 16. But all of that is kind of 
by the by now. This and its 16 year old sibling has now moved into a price point, into a price range, a price that, that's just, the whiskey is struggling to keep up at that point. There's so much competition at 80 and 85 pounds that you have to pay for this now, maybe even more for this distiller's edition that it's just easy just to not bother and to go to the multitude of other areas where you're gonna get much better whiskey, better value. Not 85, 90 pounds for a 43% diluted, watered down and chill filtered and colored Lagavulin. It just seems so out of touch. It's a shame. It is a shame because I did very much enjoy my time with this. The last two bottles have been scored eight out of 10 because of the price that you would have to pay to get this now, it can only be a seven and a half. And I know what you're saying, you know, you can't use score and, and price. And for me, it's all about value. It's not about price, it's not about cheap, it's not about expensive, it's about how much it costs to get something. And that very much weaves into my experience with that whiskey. Scoring is very much interconnected with price, in my opinion. Anyway. Let's go to the Southern Highlands, Deanston. This was a whiskey of the year for me, a fantastic whiskey of the year too. Not just because it's wonderful liquid, but it was wonderfully widely available and wonderfully well priced too. When I gave this whiskey of the year, people were picking up between 50 and 60 pounds. That was on offer, of course. There was lots of it around at good value prices. The standard retail price of this is typically about 70 to 80 pounds, which is still fine for an 18 year old whiskey. And I love it so. The reason I love it so is because this is not a typical 18 year old whiskey like sort of Anok 18, Spayburn 18 and lots of other 18 year old malts. It's not mixed maturation or it's not heavily leaning towards sherry. This is ex-bourbon maturation in this. All ex-bourbon. There is a first fill bourbon finish on this just to bring up and amplify it a little bit. I don't know why they do that. I feel like at 18 years just refill would be smashing but I'm not making the whiskey and I love what they're doing with this so maybe don't change it Deanston. There's a reason I gave this whiskey of the year, down to value, down to quality, and the increasing quality that seems to be coming from Deanston's standard official releases for decent value too. I still want to have this whiskey around. There's another bottle in there. <laughs> Replace this one, you won't be surprised to hear, and I would give Deanston 18 a nine out of 10. Great value. Switch it up with a, a world whiskey here. Go over to Ireland, to the southwest corner of Ireland to Cork. Can you hear the noise? Nobody was cutting stone when I started today. A bit like the video that I took in Spain, you really can't control the environment when you film outdoors, right? Anyway, let's go on with Dingle in the southwest of Ireland. This is batch four of their single malt whiskey. This is um, a marriage of bourbon, sherry and port casks in this one. And I was blown away by this whiskey. I loved it so. I got to try a few samples of Dingle first. I knew what I was getting into when I bought this bottle. So I was happy to pay a wee bit more than I normally would given what this is. Dingle's new, it's a new distillery. It's, it's basically a big tin shed down there in the southwest of Ireland. And, you know, to encourage growth in these new distilleries, we maybe have to accept that if we want it all natural, exactly how we want it, full transparency on the labeling, all of this stuff, we know we're maybe gonna have to pay a wee bit more for that, and that's okay when the quality is delivered like this. This is really densely flavoured, really rich whiskey. This is kind of fermentation forward, lots of ripe fruit, lots of bready notes and things in here. Wonderful stuff. Port casks would normally put me off, but I loved every drop of this. I'm now enjoying, very much enjoying their single malt that's in there right now. Great stuff coming from Dingle. This is a strong eight to eight and a half out of 10, and I would have Dingle permanently on the shelf. Good stuff. <laughs> This is an interesting one. This is from the Isle of Arran. But the reason it's interesting is that this kind of replaces where Aberlour Abuna left a vacuum, okay? Aberlour Abuna used to be 60 pounds and less for a really powerful non-age statement, Sherry Bomb at cast strength. When the prices ramped away up on Abuna, it's just kind of disappeared off everybody's radar. I don't even remember the last time I heard anybody talking about it. Is that down to availability? Is that down to price? I don't know, I'm not sure. It's been a while since I've had Abuna on the shelf. This kind of gives us a substitute there. What we've got here from Isle of Arran is Sherry Cask matured Scotch whiskey at cast strength. 
This is 55.8% ABV and it's great value too, sitting at about 55, certainly less than 60 pounds. That's terrific. I would say if you love your European oak or your more spicy, more rich, more dense kind of old school type sherry maturation, this is kind of leaning much more towards American oak type uh, sherry maturation. So it's a little bit sweeter, a little bit cleaner, a little bit lighter, that kind of style. Still fantastic stuff and at that cast strength at the price point, sherry matured whiskey is becoming a rarer thing. Well done Aaron for seeing an opportunity here. Where you are, it might actually say Sherry Bodega Cask or Bodega Cask or something, I'm not sure. Just to be clear, this is the cask strength uh, Sherry Cask version. Good stuff, Aaron. 8 out of 10. Anyway, let's finish on a high note. Two bottles to go and they're both excellent and good news stories. Uh, this is Ardemarkin's Cask Strength. This has been released now for six months and believe it or not, there was a big enough outturn out there that you can still, uh, okay, it's difficult to get, but you can still pick up occasional bottles of this here, there, and everywhere. And if you see it, and if it's at its retail price of 65 pounds, please do. This is the peatiest official release from Ardemarkin that I've actually had. This was all peated. It was very, very peat forward, this Cask Strength release, but still absolutely delicious. Full of, full of coastal notes, full of seashells, full of uh, rich spice, full of uh, just, just such a Moorish whiskey too. Ridiculously good given its young age. There's fantastic things happening out in the west coast of Scotland at Arnhemarkin Distillery and I believe this to be their best official release. I loved it. I'm so enjoying this that I've already replaced it. I managed to pick up a second bottle and I would go as far to say that I would maybe pick up a third if once I open that one, if I find it, if I happen upon it and if it's available. This is the type of whiskey that I'm enjoying right now. This is the good quality, nice balance of intensely flavored, good quality, integrity forward, open and ridiculously transparent whiskey that sits right in my lane of preference. If this is the future of whiskey, it's a very positive thing. Nine out of 10. Well done, Arne Murkin. <laughs> Finally, I almost feel bad throwing this bottle out. It's such a big, heavy, pretty thing. A very Art Deco and a nice weight to the glass. But of course, what really matters is what's inside the bottle. And for this Fetter Cairn, I'm happy to report that this is another good news story because something amazing has happened at Fetter Cairn. It's terrific stuff. The 16 year old has now gone all natural, which is a great change and you taste the difference. It's now a fantastic 16 year old Scotch well, whiskey. This is their Warehouse 2 series. This is Batch 2 from Warehouse 2. I didn't get to spend a lot of time with Batch 1, which was a mix of sherry casks and some bourbon. Uh, batch 2, this one I'm holding, is First Fill Rye and First Fill Bourbon. And then Batch 3 is still available now for about £53, £55. Great value, just go out and pick it up. It's brilliant stuff. Oddly, it's a mix of rum, red wine and bourbon, which doesn't sound like it should work, but it does. Somehow, they're taking all the cask from Warehouse 2, that's the story behind this, that's why it's called Warehouse 2. But the big thing here is that Fetter Cairn have now moved to much more natural focus. And the difference is remarkable. It's not just because there's no caramel anymore. Somebody's taking a bit of extra care, somebody's just doing better things. They're not relying on caramel or they're not relying on polish and chill filtration and dilution and, and budget end of the market. They're just pricing it perfectly and fairly. It's great stuff. If you see Warehouse 2, whether it's Batch 2, Batch 3, maybe even Batch 1, although I only had samples of the Batch 1, just buy it on site as long as it's fair priced. This is natural whiskey. This particular one is 48.5% ABV and it does vary batch to batch. Another nine out of 10 and just something that you suddenly want to hold up high and say well done. Another fantastic whiskey. Things are looking bright, even in distilleries that we once held is a bit boring. Now remember, as I've already mentioned in this kind of bizarre <laughs> recycled review that's kind of held together with a bit of spit and sellotape, I apologise, I hope it works out okay. Sometimes you can save it in editing. But remember, have a look at the links below. Don't just listen to my opinion. If you're interested in more opinions, have a look at dramface.com. I think you'll enjoy some of the content that we're sharing over there as well. Also, all the links to all the scores that I've ever given out in Recycled Reviews. <laughs> it makes for some fun reading. 
but it's all underneath. And next to every score is a link to the exact point in the video that I talk about that whiskey. Thanks for spending your time with me here in cooler Scotland and over in Spain when it was a lot warmer. And I hope to see you without power tools going off in the background for the next recycled review. In the meantime, Slajava.